You've definitely heard about this. It's everywhere. It's viral and it's sparking debate. Today, you're going to see it up close and personal. Now, of course, I'm talking about the Booga Sphere. The question isn't whether the Booga Sphere exists. It does. People filmed it. People touched it. And now, one university lab may have just dragged it out of myth and into prehistory. In March 2025, a metallic sphere zigzagged over the Colombian countryside before crashing into a field outside the town of Bawa. The video went viral almost instantly. A glowing object that changed direction mid-air, stopped without inertia, then vanished into the grass. When locals approached, they found a seamless silver orb about the size of a bowling ball. It was cool to the touch, heavy, and humming softly. Dead vegetation surrounded it, and days later, the soil still refused to recover. Weeks passed before Dr. Stephen Greer's team retrieved the object and sent trace material from its surface for laboratory testing. The results, released quietly in September, sent shockwaves through every corner of the UFO research community. The University of Georgia's radiocarbon lab stamped the material with a date of 12,560 years before present, a time when mammoths still roamed and the first human settlements were barely forming. If that date truly connects to the sphere, it predates known metallurgy by 10,000 years. Older than the pyramids, older than Gobekli Tepe, older than any civilization we've mapped, and that's why even skeptics are paying attention. Greer's own words were careful, but electric. It's certainly real, he said. It's using an energy field that's electrogravidic in nature. Whether it's purely extraterrestrial or a hybrid of ancient human and off-world design, it's something we haven't seen before. That's not an easy claim to shrug off, because whatever this object is, it doesn't behave like metal forged by human hands. Its surface is seamless, its layers are nested with impossible precision, and inside, X-ray scans show 9 to 18 microspheres floating in perfect symmetry, each one flawless, with no welds, no seams, no assembly marks. Each is positioned at exact mathematical intervals. If that geometry is intentional, we might be staring at a machine, a message, or both. When the dating report surfaced, most headlines fixated on the number 112,560. But that's not the real story. The real story is the method. Radiocarbon dating measures organic material, not metal. That means the sample tested was likely organic residue, tiny marine shells, or sediment clinging to the sphere when it was recovered. That doesn't disprove the finding, but it changes what it means. The material might mark when the sphere landed, not when it was made. If the residue dates to the late Pleistocene, it could mean the object has been buried since before recorded history. Even that possibility forces uncomfortable questions. How could a seamless metallic object have existed that far back? Who made it? And if not us, then who was here? This is where speculation needs to step aside for science, because every piece of this puzzle can be tested today. Every claim can be verified or destroyed by the tools already sitting in modern laboratories. The sphere's structure is the first clue. Its three concentric shells are made of distinct alloys separated by air gaps. That design isn't decorative, it's functional. Layering like that can create containment for energy fields or reduce electromagnetic interference. More interestingly, it mirrors descriptions of electrogravitic systems that attempt to manipulate inertia through field differentials. In other words, this thing may not just have flown, it may have controlled how gravity interacted with its mass. Then there are the microspheres inside, suspended like pearls in a magnetic ocean. If their positioning follows precise mathematical ratios, say Fibonacci spacing or prime number intervals, that arrangement could store data. In three-dimensional space, distance itself can act as code. Think of each microsphere as a zero or one, not written in ink but in geometry. The entire interior could be a 3D data lattice, an alien hard drive designed to survive time. Researchers already know how to test that. Industrial-grade computer tomography can scan the entire object without touching it. Thousands of X-ray angles can reconstruct a digital twin accurate to the micron. From there, artificial intelligence can map every microsphere, analyze spacing, and search for symmetry, 
redundancy, or repeating patterns. If repetition appears, that's not randomness, it's communication. Machines love redundancy because it preserves information. Nature rarely repeats itself perfectly. If the microspheres align according to any known data encoding principle, then we're looking at intention, a message built from metal instead of language. The landing site itself adds another layer of intrigue. Witnesses said the grass died instantly and never regrew. That isn't normal impact damage, it's dehydration. Moisture was ripped from the soil so fast, the ground turns sterile. When an object emits a powerful electromagnetic or electrogravitic field, it can strip bound water molecules from clay in seconds. That's testable physics. Collect the dirt. Compare its hydration profile with samples taken 10 meters away. If the landing zone holds less bound water and altered dielectric properties, something energetic happened there and something non-terrestrial at least in mechanism, touch that field. Now look closer at the flight. The sphere didn't fall like debris, it zigzagged. That movement violates ballistic physics. An object can only do that if it's under intelligent control. Controlled flight leaves scars, microscopic abrasions, directional burn marks, asymmetric wear. If the outer surface shows leading edge erosion consistent with atmospheric vectoring, the evidence speaks for itself. Straight descent means a fall, a zigzag means a decision. The sphere, whatever it is, made decisions. But the biggest story may not be how it moved, it's what it's made of. Metals tell their own history. Every element carries a unique isotope signature, a fingerprint from the place it formed. Earthly titanium, for example, has stable isotope ratios that differ from meteorotic titanium. Those ratios can't be faked, only measured. Modern mass spectrometers can detect deviations at the atomic level. If the Bugosphere's isotopes fall outside terrestrial norms, that's not a theory, that's proof of non-Earth origin. Then comes microstructure. When humans forge, cast or weld metal, the crystals inside form boundaries that reveal the process, grain size, direction, thermal history. A manufactured object always carries those scars, but if this sphere shows no weld zones between layers, no heat-affected seams, then the layers weren't joined, they were grown. That's manufacturing beyond our documented methods. Yet the most haunting part is that the sphere might still be active. Some metals behave like antennas, resonating with external fields. If it's generating low-frequency electromagnetic pulses, those can be measured without touching it. Loop antennas could sweep its field from a distance, Passive scans could log emissions below a kilohertz, the kind that oscillates slowly, like a sleeping heartbeat. If the sphere emits periodic rhythms or thermal pulses independent of ambient temperature, that suggests a process inside still running. Machines keep time, stones don't. The implications are dizzying, but here's what grounds it. Every one of these observations can be tested without cutting or destroying the object. It doesn't require belief, it requires a checklist and courage. That's why scientists are watching this case carefully, even if they won't say it publicly, because if this really is what it appears to be, an engineered object older than civilization, then history just got rewritten. Either humans built technology and forgot it, or someone else left a breadcrumb for us to find once we reached their level of understanding. If even one of the proposed tests confirms an anomaly, non-terrestrial isotopes, intelligent internal geometry, field-coupled emissions, then the conversation shifts permanently from myth to evidence. And if all the tests come back normal, we still win, because the mystery ends in data, not speculation. Every step forward, even toward a null result, tells us something. The Bugosphere will either break science or strengthen it. Greer calls it a doorway, and that may be the most accurate description of all, because whatever side of the debate you're on, Something ancient just knocked, and it's our turn to open the door. When Greer released the results, mainstream science barely blinked. The press focused on the easy rebuttal, metals can't be carbon dated. But in research circles, something different was happening. Quiet phone calls, private lab inquiries, professors requesting anonymized access to the sphere's composition data. No one wanted to risk their reputation on speculation, but no one wanted to miss the chance to be first if the anomaly turned out to be real. 
That's how revolutions always begin, with whispers, not headlines. In the weeks after the announcement, the sphere was placed in secure storage under 24-hour surveillance. Every power line, every light fixture, every sensor in that room was isolated from the building grid. They wanted silence, electrical silence, to watch for anything the sphere might do on its own. And within days, it did something small but measurable. The temperature near the shell rose by less than half a degree. It fluctuated every six hours, regular as a pulse. The readings weren't dramatic, but they were consistent. Controlled lab temperature doesn't drift like that unless something inside is responding to time. The investigators didn't make the data public, not yet. They knew how fast the story could spin. Instead, they started the next stage quietly, running scans no one outside the project even knew had begun. First came the composition maps, scanning electron microscopy, paired with energy dispersive spectroscopy, revealed something nobody expected a titanium aluminum alloy with trace elements that didn't match any known industrial grade. Its microstructure showed no casting marks, no directional flow, no evidence of how it was formed. It wasn't poured, it wasn't rolled, it simply existed as if it had been crystallized into its final shape. Then came the isotope ratios. Titanium has five stable isotopes and on Earth, their percentages are consistent across every sample ever measured. The Booger Sphere's ratios were off slightly, but undeniably. It matched no terrestrial source, not even meteoritic titanium. The deviation was small enough to make sense if the material came from a place with subtly different stellar chemistry, somewhere nearby in cosmic terms, but not here. Still, no one wanted to call it alien. Uncatalogued source was the official term. It sounded safer. Next came the grain structure. Under extreme magnification, the layers inside the sphere told an impossible story. The inner core and middle shell were aligned, as though grown together in sequence, yet no boundary between them showed a fusion line. It was as if each layer formed in perfect harmony with the next, atom by atom, without heat, without assembly, without joints. That kind of uniformity shouldn't exist outside of advanced additive manufacturing, and even then, not this clean, one metallurgist who saw the images said quietly, We couldn't make this today. Not at that scale. Not even close. That's when a theory began to take shape. One more fascinating, and maybe more frightening, than the alien explanation. What if the sphere wasn't from another world at all? What if it was a memory, a remnant of human capability lost to time? If the date associated with it truly places it near the Younger Dryer's boundary, around 12,000 years ago, then it lands at the exact point in history when Earth's climate suddenly changed. The glaciers receded, sea levels surged, entire ecosystems collapsed. Some researchers have long speculated that an advanced culture could have existed before that cataclysm wiped clean, its technology erased by fire and flood. If the sphere survived from that era, it would mean we weren't the first version of civilization to master engineering. We were the reboot. The implications are staggering. But there's one way to know for sure, independent replication. Greer's team proposed a transparent, multi-lab process, chain of custody, blind samples, time-locked protocols. In simple terms, that means every test must be done in duplicate, every handoff logged, every method published before results are seen, no tampering, no editing after the fact. Once protocols are time-stamped publicly, they can't be rewritten. It's the same process used in criminal forensics and high-stakes pharmaceutical trials. Two separate labs will receive identical shavings from the same region of the sphere. Neither will know which sample came from the object and neither will communicate with the other until results are finalized. If both datasets match, bias is eliminated. If they diverge, contamination or error is immediately flagged. That's how truth stands up under pressure. Beyond chemistry, a new layer of testing has scientists buzzing, AI-based internal decoding. High-resolution CT scans of the inner microspheres can now generate point cloud data, accurate enough to model each sphere's location, spacing, and alignment within a tenth of a millimeter. Feed that data into a quantum-trained neural network, the kind used for protein folding and complex pattern prediction, 
and the algorithm can detect non-random geometry, symmetry, repetition and sequence. If those microspheres form a deliberate mathematical pattern, it will show up as an anomaly in spatial entropy, too orderly for chance, too precise for nature. That's how you prove design without touching a single piece of metal. One researcher involved put it bluntly, if it encodes anything, AI will see it first. Humans miss the patterns, machines don't. The next step is non-destructive electromagnetic interrogation. By exposing the sphere to controlled magnetic fields, far weaker than an MRI, scientists can watch for structured responses, resonant coupling, field absorption, or phase lag echoes. Metals behave predictably, circuits don't. If the sphere exhibits a delayed or frequency-selective response, something inside is actively interacting with its environment. So far, everything points to one of three possibilities. If the tests confirm deliberate architecture, non-terrestrial isotope ratios, and structured emissions, it's an engineered artifact. Something built, not born, by a civilization we don't yet know how to name. If the materials prove terrestrial, but the methods are advanced. It's an ancient human device. Evidence that our ancestors reached technological heights we've long forgotten. And if it all turns out to be natural, an oddly formed metallic concretion that fooled everyone, then at least we'll have built a framework for how to investigate the next anomaly properly. Each path rewrites something fundamental. One changes our understanding of physics. One rewrites human history. And one improves scientific integrity for every discovery that follows. That's the genius of the open data model Greer's team proposed. Every scan, every measurement, every result will be uploaded to public repositories for peer analysis. No gatekeeping, no secrecy, no special access, just raw data anyone can study, from graduate students to government scientists. It's how modern breakthroughs happen. Transparency, not mythology because truth doesn't fear replication, it demands it. The more you look at this story, the less it feels like science fiction, and the more it feels like a collision between timelines. A polished object humming quietly in a lab might hold the fingerprints of minds that lived and died before the world we know began. If they existed, they weren't gods or aliens, just people who saw farther, built smarter, and vanished before we could remember them. That's why this investigation matters not for proof of visitors from the stars, but for proof that human potential may have already reached the stars and then started over. The sphere could still turn out to be a misidentified artifact, a coincidence of physics and curiosity. But it's also possible that buried beneath centuries of skepticism lies a truth we've all been circling, that knowledge doesn't just evolve forward, it loops, it hides, it waits to be rediscovered. If even one test result confirms what the geometry already suggests, if those inner microspheres form language, or code, or sequence, then every boundary we've drawn around human history collapses. The world before us may have been more advanced, more connected, and more aware than we've ever imagined. And if that's true, then the Bugosphere isn't just an artifact, it's a message sent across millennia. Not from them to us, but from us to ourselves. Because maybe we've been here before, and maybe for the first time, something we built long ago has come home.